So yeah, it's my pleasure to... Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon and uh, good morning, <laughs> good evening. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, chair this session with uh, Ana Maria de Bartolo, who's going to speak first. Then we're going to move on to uh, Hane Tange uh, from the University uh, of Aalborg in Denmark. And uh, in the last place um, will be um, Simon Coffey, uh, who's uh, speaking from um, King's College London. So the first speaker um, today in this session is Ana Maria de Bartolo, who will be talking about exploring differences between native and non-native learners' attitudes towards intercultural communication. And Ana Maria is particularly interested in intercultural communication through English as a lingua franca. Over to you, Ana Maria. The floor okay, is thank, you very, thank you very much, Cristina. Um, and it's a great pleasure for me to participate in this conference. It's the first time that I participate in a YALI conference, and it's a very interesting and stimulating environment for me. So thank you very much. Okay, I'll um, share my screen. I hope that it works well. Okay. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Okay, so the, the topic of my presentation, the title of my presentation is um, exploring learner attitudes towards um, exploring um, difference between native and non-native learners attitudes towards intercultural communication. I'm going to give a brief outline of my presentation. So I'm, I'm briefly describing the objectives and the background to the study, uh, the theoretical framework, the study, the methodology that I carried out, the, some preliminary findings, some final considerations, and also pedagogical considerations. So the objectives and background to the study. Um, the objective of the study is to um, explore students' perceptions towards culture and intercultural communication through English as a lingua franca. Um, it is a follow-up of a previous study uh, which has um, which was carried out about one year ago in 2020 uh, and the first part of the study has involved international students studying at the University of Calabria in Italy um, belonging to different degree course then it was decided to expand the analysis with a larger sample to identify similarities and dif or differences between two different groups, which I'm going to describe uh, shortly. So the aim was to gather um, further insights into the factors which affect intercultural communication, the extent to which culture can impact on intercultural communication. So this is a bit of the background to my study, um, the theoretical framework. Uh, um, the relationship between culture and language has been extensively explored by a number of scholars. Um, a researcher um, points out that uh, culture and language are closely linked as human language is always embedded in culture. Uh, however, a particular language is not necessarily linked to a particular culture. So cultures and languages can be separated. There is nothing inherent in the language itself that, carry, that carries cultural baggage or cultural scripts. Uh, as research into global languages and health have shown, there is a huge variety in the way English is used and the culture scripts through which English linguistic forms operate. Uh, particularly relevant uh, in the light of this discussion is the idea of culture has connected to transcultural uh, flows. Um, Cultural and linguistic practices, according to this view, are in a constant flow, moving from one context to another, cutting across and through nationally defined cultures and drawing on multiple linguistic and cultural resources, which are constantly adapted and changed in the process. Uh, Kanagaraja highlights the relevance of translocal spaces, translingual practices, which characterize plurilingual communicative practices. Uh, therefore, in this context, uh, norms of communication are not well defined. 
and established whether they're open to change, negotiation, and mediation. Uh, according to this view, language is a complex system which emerges bottom up from interaction of multiple agents in speech communities, rather than a static system composed of top-down grammatical rules of principles. Um, therefore, culture and language are seen as nested systems, systems within systems which mutually co-evolve and with each influencing and adapting to the others and with the boundaries between them as fuzzy and blurred. So basically, this is the theoretical approach that has informed my study, the present study, uh, which has attempted to explore the relationship between language and culture from a cultural and intercultural perspective, a perspective drawing particularly on the concept of linguistic and cultural uh, flows, which emerge, as I said, as a result of change, negotiation, adaptation. Um, uh, therefore, the study, uh, participant and settings. Uh, the study has investigated two groups of participants. Uh, the first group um, was made up of 168 respondents from uh, different cultural linguistic backgrounds. They were international students uh, studying at the University of Calabria, where I, uh, where I work in Italy. Um, 153 uh, stated to be non-native English speakers and only 15 native English speakers. Uh, the second group, so the second part of the study, which was carried out um, about a year later, uh, was made up of um, 58 respondents from target language environments. Um, they um, belong to one American university, uh, Loyola University in Chicago, or the Department of Italian and American Studies, and um, Alberta University in Canada, the Department of Sociology. Um, 40 students uh, were native English speakers, 18 non-native English speakers. Um, an online questionnaire was composed and was used um, as a research instrument to collect quantitative uh, data from the participants. Um, the link to the questionnaire, um, as well as the overall objectives of the questionnaire, was uh, emailed to uh, the two lecturers in um, USA and Canada who had accepted to participate in the study, and they forwarded further the link to their students. At the time, the lessons were um, um, the lesson were only online, so they they had had online contacts with the students. So they informed the students about the, the study, about the objectives they accepted to participate and to um, fill the questionnaire. Um, Okay, so the methodology, so the first part of the questionnaire, uh, I briefly um, described how it was composed, was a preliminary section um, whose aim was to identify students' language background. So participants were asked to indicate uh, whether they're native English speakers or non-native English speakers. Um, native speakers were also asked to specify uh, which variety of English they um, use, they spoke, a native variety, British American English or a non native varieties such as Indian English, African English, Malaysian English, etc. Um, while the second section of the questionnaire um, includes nine items aimed at investigating students' um, awareness of the relation between language and, and culture. Uh, and, and these are the, the question, culture and, culture and language are closely linked, language is culture, a language represents a specific culture with its word views, values, and beliefs. The English language is linked to English culture. Only cultures and specific languages can be separated. In multicultural settings, negotiation strategies, confirmation checks, clarification requests, paraphrasing, repetitions, code mixings contribute to achieve effective communication in English. Uh, English use in multicultural settings enables speakers to share their different cultures. In order to communicate effectively, it is important to understand the influence of culture on communication. In order to communicate effectively, it is necessary to know the culture of the people you are communicating with. Uh, this questionnaire has been adapted from Baker's study in uh, 2015. Um, the survey was anonymous, so students did not feel pressure in reporting their answers, and they were asked to record the responses on a Likert, five-point Likert scale, uh, ranging from one strongly disagree to five strongly agree. So they had to report the um, degree of agreement or disagreement with uh, the following statements. 
Uh, then it was a, a third and final section, which included six items, um, specifically, uh, which specifically addressed the factors that may facilitate successful intercultural communication in their opinions, in the respondents' opinion. Um, and these were the last uh, questions, knowing about the way other non-native English speakers use English, knowing about the culture of the non-native English speakers you are communicating with, um, knowing about the culture of native English speaking countries, uh, having a native-like pronunciation using correct native-like grammar, knowing about the relationship between language and culture. And again, they had to report their answers on a scale from one to five, according to their level of agreement with uh, these statements. Um, so why did they choose this particular context? The University of Calabria, because it's the, the place where I worked, where I had the possibility to get some data. Uh, and then I also chose these American and Canadian universities, as I, 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 I thought, because Canadian and American universities are known to be multicultural environment, where um, academic staff, there is a number of academic, academic staff and professionals were non-native English speakers. Um, and uh, studies report that for many students, classes, classes at universities are their first major exposure to people from other countries and to non-native English. Uh, therefore, also studies suggest that there is a positive correlation between students' attitudes towards non-native English and their familiarity to it, their exposure to it. So the uh, the idea was to investigate whether higher exposure, uh, perceived higher exposure to non-native English and more direct involvement in multicultural academic communities where uh, English is uh, the main means of communication, the main means of academic instruction, may lead to more or less positive attitudes towards intercultural communication. My hypothesis was that the second group was more uh, exposed to non-native English, uh, therefore more aware aware of issues affecting intercultural communication, more willing to accommodate intercultural misunderstandings when they uh, occur. Um, so I'll go into the analysis. I'll explain how I carried out the analysis. Uh, the analysis um, has investigated um, comparison of mean scores in the two sample groups. Uh, so I carried out a quantitative analysis to identify similarities or a difference between learner responses in terms of attitudes. Um, this is the statistical test that I used because the sum of the sample considered was larger than 100. So um, it was decided to use the two-tailed nor normal distribution Z, which was applied and statistically significant differences observed. So they values uh, higher than 1.97 or lower than minus 1.97 um, show that um, uh, we may, for some of these responses, we may reject the null hypothesis. So there are significant differences uh, between the means um, in the two groups. In all the other cases, um, the null hypothesis is accepted, so meaning that there are no significant differences between the means in the two groups. So quickly, these are the, the data that I, uh, that I collected. Uh, these are the means, this descriptive statistics, and this is the, uh, the test, the, uh, the two-tailed normal distribution tests. Um, as far as uh, the results, very quickly, I'm just uh, pointing out the most relevant um, results, in my opinion. Um, of course, what I didn't say, but I, I, I would like to point this out, I would like to highlight is that um, this uh, study does not mean to, uh, to give any definite conclusion at the present stage, to draw any definite conclusion or to be comprehensive, having relied on statistical analysis exclusively. So it may be interesting for me to carry um, out uh, further analysis also by using uh, different methodologies, maybe interviews, which was also my original idea, but because of a number of a number of problems, uh, pandemic in fur first, but also for other reason, it was not possible to carry out this, this phase. So at the moment, these are the data which I um, managed to collect and analyze. Um, 
so as far as the analysis is concerned, as I was saying, um, some of these questions, such as question 10, um, knowing about the way other non-native English speakers use English and knowing about the culture of the non-native English speakers you are communicating with. And in order to communicate effectively, it is necessary to know the culture of the people you are communicating with, present higher mean scores in the second group with some stati with statistical significant differences observed. Um, these results um, suggest uh, participants' positive attitudes uh, from group two towards their interlocutors' cultures, the role that culture, culture may play in communication. And this idea is um, reinforced in question one, culture and language are closely linked with higher mean scores again in group two and statistical significant differences of, observed. Um, so from the preliminary results, um, we may suggest that respondents from group two seem to consider the way non-native speakers use English in interaction an important factor to achieve successful communication. Uh, question three, a language represents a specific culture with its world views, values, and beliefs, presents, on the contrary, higher mean scores in group one, with no statistical difference observed, though. Um, my, my interpretation was that um, students who have less opportunity to experience uh, health communicative context are maybe more likely to view languages as attached to specific national cultures with, which reflect those values and beliefs. Um, the idea of languages as crossing borders and transcending well-defined cultures is not revealed apparently in group one responses. Uh, in, while empirical studies, on the contrary, have largely highlighted that English as a lingua franca is hybrid and deterritorialized. Uh, English as a lingua franca transcends national borders, draws on cultural flows and multiple linguistic resources that are modified and recreated always during communication, during interaction. Um, significant differences in the data is also observed in question 14 uh, using coordinative like grammar, uh, which presents slightly higher mean scores in the first group. And question 13, having a native like pronunciation also reveals higher scores in the first group, though no statistical significance is observed in this particular question. Um, so students from the second group, uh, from group two, I'm sorry, there's a mistake here, do not seem to consider uh, the use of standard British American grammar or standard British American native pronunciation as a relevant factors, as a relevant factor in facilitating intercultural uh, communication through English. Um, Briefly, there is also the, I also carried out a second part of the analysis because I also compared uh, mean scores between native and non-native speaker responses to test statistically significant differences. On the overall sample, which was made up of 226 participants, uh, 171 um, were non-native English speakers and 55 native English speakers. Again, um, as a statistical measure, I use the two-tailed normal distribution Z. Uh, so values higher than um, uh, 1.96 indicate that non-native English speakers answered on average significantly more favorably. Values lower than minus 1.96 indicate that non-native English speakers answered on average signif significantly more uh, positively. Okay, so these are um, the tables. Uh, first, this is, um, um, these are the mean scores for natives and non-natives, and this is the theta test um, for natives and non-natives. Okay, um, what I, I um, what I um, interpreted from the data was that native English speakers um, seem to manifest more positive attitudes uh, towards the factors facilitating intercultural communication as the test shows for uh, question 10, knowing about the way other non-native English speakers use English and question 11, knowing about the culture of the non-native English speakers you are communicating with. So they seem to um, manifest more positive attitudes towards these um, aspects. Um, 
They seem to recognize that English has spread in many different contexts and diversified in a variety of non-native forms uh, which are used in intercultural uh, settings. So they may be more aware that languages and cultures are not limited within geographical and cultural boundaries. Uh, this is not to say that um, um, English is a unique form of intercultural communication compared to other languages, but given the unprecedented spread of English uh, all over the world, uh, it is more likely that intercultural communication occurs through English than happens through English than through any other languages used as a lingua franca. Um, uh, so I'm coming to the conclusion, um, as I said, uh, they're not definite conclusion, but conclusion based on uh, this part of the analysis. Uh, the conclusion may, the results may suggest that awareness of culture and language may play an important role in enhancing intercultural communication, um, engaging with different cultures and different varieties of English, uh, enrich intercultural communication and understanding. Um, and there is also a positive correlation between uh, learners' exposure to multicultural environments uh, where English is used as the main means of intercultural communication and higher uh, acceptance, awareness of the diversity of English. Uh, and uh, the pedagogical consideration that I, I draw from this is that um, uh, studying how uh, learners perceive intercultural communication issues may uh, raise um, EFL teachers' awareness of the need to incorporate intercultural communication in their lessons. Uh, and intercultural communication, at least in the context I come from, uh, is not very much um, part of the language curricula. Um, and it's often relegated to a fifth and last skill after the other four have been covered. Um, as scholars said, um, embracing intercultural communication in the classroom can be very, very interesting because it may open students new doors, encourage them to enlarge their perspective and experiment what communication entails in the multifaceted English world where cultural diversity and unconventional language norms allow for new encounters in deeper understanding. Uh, therefore, uh, as final considerations, um, intercultural communication should have a fundamental role in EFL classroom, in the EFL classroom. Uh, elf studies, as health studies have demonstrated, uh, the majority of interaction through English occur among non-native English speakers, who by sharing their different cultures successfully communicate. Um, therefore, it is essential to provide our learners with a realistic and meaningful communicative model and with the necessary competence to function also in diverse and changing cultural contexts, which most of the time are far removed from the standard native speaker model the teaching materials uh, present for language students. Okay, so these are my final considerations. Uh, these are the uh, references which I have consulted some of the reference, not all of them. Okay, oops. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ana Maria. That, that was very interesting and uh, very well done. I hope well I manage, manage with, the with the time. <laughs> Sorry? I hope I manage with the time because I couldn't yeah, yeah, yeah. see. Yes, yes, yes. No, that was good, good timing. Thank you very much. Um, now we've got a few minutes for questions, so um, I'll I invite the rest of the audience to uh, to pose any questions you may have to Ana Maria. Well, we wait for people to uh, pose their questions. I just had. Um, a question myself about how how do you propose? I mean, you, you talk about the importance of uh, including intercultural communication training in in uh, English language teaching, and in particular in the context of uh, English as a lingua franca. How how do you propose to do that? Have you got any ideas on how to put that into practice? Um, 
Yes, maybe uh, the idea could be showing to maybe students different uh, different accents of English because they are at the moment they are used to uh, they are basically trained on native in, native English or American accents. So maybe um, showing them that other accents exist that they are valid and legitimate um, could be an idea. So training them to recognize uh, diversity through different accents, also uh, different ways of uh, expressing the same context but in a different way so uh, working on accent could be my first uh, my first idea but there may be other other suggestions as well but i haven't um, actually focused on that in detail yet yes yeah no that's a very good point you make i think accent is a very good um, aspect of uh, of identity and and, um, mm -hmm. and culture mm. yes mm -hmm. I'm trying to remove condivisione, but I, I don't know how to do this from here. Uh, to do, sorry, what did you say? Uh, remove the sharing, remove, sorry, remove the sharing. I was looking at my screen. It, is, right. it has been removed, I think. I see. We don't, we don't see your PowerPoint now. Ah, okay, right? okay, because yeah. I, okay, thank you. Anna, I was interested if we've got a couple of minutes, if you could um, say something about your choice to use the ELF paradigm uh, in a way for your study was that um, what difference did it make that you brought in the elf literature compared to a more sort of well a non-elf orientation in a way what did you find that that was something that was integral to your study was it necessary in a way to bring that in Yes, uh, yes, my, my idea was to, well, I, I got interested in health, um, because health is um, um, the, 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 the way a non-native speaker communicates through English. So the, the way non-native, since the majority has, health scholars have pointed out, the majority of interactions through English occur between non-native speakers of English rather than between native speakers of English, I got interested in trying to explore the way communication actually occurs through native English speakers. And actually, I was also read um, about prejudices and stereotypes towards uh, non-native English speakers in some context. So I was interested to investigate a little bit more to see whether this or to what extent this was actually um, the case. And um, I think that raising awareness of these issues may contribute to break some of the stereotypes behind the native speaker myth, let's say. I'm not against, of course, native speakers of English, but I think that um, uh, language teachers, uh, language students or students in general should be more aware um, of how intercultural communication occurs through English, used as a lingua franca, and this could, be, could contribute to enrich communication from different perspectives. So I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you, Ana Maria. I think if there are no more questions, we should move on to the next speaker. But thank you very much for uh, this very interesting contribution. contribution. Thank you. Thank you, right, for thank you. Right, so the next speaker is um, Hane Tange. Uh, from the University of Aalborg uh, in Denmark. Um, she um, is interested in international and intercultural education, and that's what her um, talk is going to be about. Uh, the title of the talk is Alternative Internationalizations, Building Hope in an Age of Disruption. Very, very important and timely title. Um, Thank you very much, yours, Chris. Honey. Thank you very much, Christina. And I will try sharing. And you promise me you shout if this doesn't work because I'm afraid it didn't do this so last time I tried this. I might as well say this, this is something. This is a product of reflections that's been going on for years, since 2018, as a matter of fact. Because this is when things started to be disrupted in Denmark. So. I started out by being very, very panicky when we saw the first closing downs of international higher education. I spent years now thinking about it and talking to various managers, talking to scholars, talking to students, 
And now I'm trying to say, well, what can we do about it? And actually say, well, what is going to be the next step forward? And this is where I'm playing around with this idea of what I call alternative international stations. And just to, uh, well, explain the amount of disruption. When I discovered that these talks are being recorded, I had to remove all my pictures and replace them with pictures of my own, just to make sure that I do not violate any GDPR regulations within the European Union. So these pictures, well, one is from, in fact, the Nordic Conference of Intercultural Communication 2018 at Olbo, which is immediately after the first government ban on international students. And these were the signs that the students had put on campus uh, protesting against the intervention against international recruitment. The other picture is the students protesting outside the Ministry of Science in spring 2019. The original pictures were pictures of the US border closed and COVID-19, and I think they should be added. I also think Brexit should be added, and I think new nationalism around Europe should be added to this, because when we debate internationalization today, we're debating disruption around the world, basically. So we are really in a situation where we probably cannot go on pretending that this is business as usual. But what we should then start asking is, what is it actually that's being disrupted? Yes, we looked at internationalism and internationalization for a while, but we probably looked at it through a neoliberal lens. When international higher education was all about growth, human capital, diversity management, recruiting students to make money. Looking at well, some of the things Byram has been writing, but I think Byram is building very much on Jonas Steer's work here. We could add the alternative vision of moral internationalism and say, well, perhaps we should look for something else. We should look for human needs, global citizenship, mutual respect, and then perhaps consider what exactly has been hit. The neoliberal paradigm, we want to recruit for money or something else. I hope the sound is still Sorry okay. to interrupt you, honey. Yeah, you're not, uh, you're muted. You're muted, Christina. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt, honey, but um, your power. It's muted again, but Hannah, she's asking if you could page forward your PowerPoint, please. Yeah, well, that's the problem. I've had this before with uh, yeah. this. This is my Zoom problem at present. So I'll probably need to use this format. Is it OK now? Yeah, it's OK now. And that, that's the problem, Mike. And uh, this is probably a computer update thing. <laughs> right. I warned you, Christina. Okay, no. Yeah, you did. You did. <laughs> All right. You'll just, you okay. just have to do with this format, I'm afraid. Yeah. Anyway, you're not missed much except the pictures, of course. I should show you the pictures. But basically, this is the thing about rethinking. What can we do? So I'm taking us in a way back to square one. And so well, what is it we're trying to achieve? And I might as well admit I'm a moral internationalist. I am not an irreliable internationalist. So if we start asking if the educational purpose behind internationalizing is to develop an internationalist mindset, intercultural competences, global citizenship, education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, perhaps we should start thinking about forms of internationalization without the travel. Very recently, I read an article by Lopez Rocha where she's basically claiming that perhaps sending students abroad may not necessarily facilitate intercultural learning. That in fact, when we send students abroad, we may reinforce their idea of a particular country. We may see them cluster in national groups. And I certainly lived in some of those when I studied at the University of Glasgow. Well, not myself personally, as I happened to be the only Dane that year, but I certainly met the Greek community. I met the Italian community. I met the Spanish community. I met the Norwegian community. So I think we've all seen that, that in fact, you may really go abroad to meet people of your own kind and then you talk to them in your native language about all the funny things in the, in the foreign context. So perhaps if the educational purpose is intercultural international competence development, we can look for different models. This is where it becomes a bit conceptual, I'm afraid, and uh, I don't I cannot present as much analysis as the previous paper because I'm really still in the thinking process. Looking at the literature, I found three core concepts that I think are useful here. Contact 
community and connections. And I'll just run through what I mean by those. First of all, intercultural education of the kind that I've read about requires places to meet. Remember, it doesn't require international places to meet, but it, it requires this idea of the contact zone, the space where people who would normally be geographically separated will come into contact with each other. So the people who don't necessarily interact on a normal everyday basis will have a space where they can find one another. And not interacting on an everyday basis might in fact not necessarily involve travel because there are plenty of parts in our own home cities where we don't go, where students don't go. The second key concept is Lugona's concept of the borderland, where we're all in a state of liminality, where somehow we transcend the confines of the normal. Lugonus is concerned with the relationship between minorities and majorities, with those who oppress and those who are being oppressed. We need a neutral space where somehow relations of domination become less important. And to just highlight one example of relations of domination, when we look at international higher education, well, for many years, I was working at the Aarhus School of Business. We welcomed exchange students from Oregon State University. These exchange students took for granted their right of communicating in English without ever bothering with Danish, which of course is a native language of that specific context. So there are certain positions in international higher education that are dominant, which is the point Lopez Rocha was making. Finally, we can look into this idea of the third space pedagogy, where we as educators examine our own beliefs, where we take into account that there are alternative knowledges and skills possessed by learners. And I think we heard this in the plenary yesterday about other understandings of language that perhaps might enlighten the linguists, even if they might come from very different indigenous traditions. My second key concept is the idea of communities where we engage with other people other people, not the other. I am aware that I used the quotation mark and the capitalization. I was a bit uncertain whether to do this or not because there is this othering discourse in intercultural communication. However, I think it is important to realize that community service is all about meeting the people we don't meet in our academic comfort zone because this is what initiates learning. So some of the models we have in global service learning where we move into different contexts, cultures, people. We meet across some kind of boundary. But we also see local service projects close at home. For, for instance, and Sharky's study is a very interesting example of this, teachers from a white majority background might be sent on internships or work practice in minority communities. Finally, I'm a keen supporter of extracurricular voluntary work, as you'll see later. So the activities that we are creating to somehow get people to talk, get people to meet one another. My third concept is connections or connectivism, networking across. I came across this idea of connectivism in a paper from engineering, and I'm not sure whether it's been used by anybody else, but I actually quite like the definition that these people offer. So I'll just read that to you. A new paradigm to manage internationalization processes at the institutional level, from internal notes to outside networks where communities, knowledge, experiences, subjects, and learning can connect globally. So we're looking for nodal points in these networks. Some of the theories I believe that might have inspired this idea of connectivism would be Hannett's idea of con transnational connections. A new paradigm or way of understanding international station, international station at a distance where we're no longer moving people, we are moving ideas, exactly what we're doing today, because we're locking on via computers to a transnational network, so we can actually connect, even if we stay within our home context, our own countries. A final inspiration is Castles and this idea of networked social movements, 
because transnational movements, trans transnational communities of the kind that are now facilitated via social media, via Facebook, well, I believe they are an important inspiration for how we can develop international higher education in future. I think there's a lot of there to be gained. The way the students will interact, the way the students will join in communities with people from around the world who share their interest. So looking at my two examples, and I said, this is very superficial, but I'll just give you examples of transnational movements, organizations, and I'm speaking about transnational movements for hope, not for anger or frustration, which is really what Castles is working with. And then I'm going to talk you through what we call a global graduate program, which is really about how we try to nudge our students to seek and establish connections. The badges, by the way, is the Scouts of the World Award, which I happen to be convening in Denmark for a couple of years, a while ago. So the first example, and this is, this is so big, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to be doing with it just yet. But only two years ago, the five largest youth movements, so the World Organization of Scouts, YMCA, YWCA, the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts, Red Cross, Red Crescent Societies and the Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme came together to form what they call the Big Six Organization for Non-Formal Youth Education. This is a massive transnational movement. 250 million young people coming together to be empowered through leadership training. That's a force to be reckoned with. And this is something certainly where I see a potential for developing connections and the potential for getting young people to engage with each other across whatever linguistic national divides that are currently caused by, for instance, the rise of neo-nationalism in Europe. So what is it we can see here? Well, a recent example, in fact, well, I was watching post-COVID-19, the, the global youth mobilization. If anybody's looking at how, what you can do and how you can build hope after COVID-19, go look at that campaign. They're coming together to lobby the European Union, UNESCO, World Health Organization, in order to promote the interest of young people, the COVID-19 generation around the world. We also saw, for instance, the World Scout Organization present at COP26 in Glasgow with Bea Grylls, Chief Scout from Britain, speaking about why for young people, it's important that politicians act on climate change. So I think there's lots of hope to be had here. But what is it they're doing in terms of my conceptual framework? Well, first of all, we see this transnational movement of hope, connections. There's a network structure here where the single member of a scout unit or the local world Red Cross organization can connect with a global organization. So they have an infrastructure if they want to interact on a global scale. We have physical contact points, and the Scouts is an obvious example to pick. They have world centers, they have a World Scout Jamboree, but they also have a very well-developed virtual network that people can use, that you can connect. You make friends by, for instance, befriending them on Facebook, by joining on Facebook, by joining specific groups for people with certain interests. Finally, there is this idea of community service, which is the one thing uniting the big six organizations, because they're all committed to some kind of action within the local and the global community. So it's not just enough to go out if you're a small scout, the beaver scout in the UK, collecting rubbish on the beach. When you grow older, you might contribute to global projects. You might do crowdfunding for people in a very different part of the world, which you saw very recently when scouts around the world would collect funding for the Afghan scouts and guides helping out when Taliban took control of Kabul for just, I guess, three, four months ago. So this is one example, and this is a big example, of course, of an organization that can facilitate an alternative form of internationalization. A second example is very close to home. This is our own global graduate program. You can Google it if you want to find out more. It's very 
detailed description because it actually lives on its home page. And I know that because I happened to convene the program. This is something that we did in 2016 because we were told in a study survey that the Danish and the international students simply didn't meet. They were working in parallel communities, similar to the findings that I believe we've seen from international campuses around the world. So we sought to nudge the students to engage with intercultural and international activities that might facilitate learning. This means that we now have an infrastructure. Many of our international students are now gone from these programs, but we still have a framework in place that can somehow encourage them to engage in activities that will foster some form of intercultural learning. Over a period of well, typically the BA studies, but we've seen examples also of MA students collecting points, they will participate in a number of activities that was, we believe are important to stimulate intercultural learning. We put in a multicultural project exercise, which is obligatory because we are a university based on a principle of problem-based learning. So this idea of the project group is very important to the pedagogy at the University of Olbo. We strongly recommend the students engage in international at home activities, voluntary work. If they don't do so, they're probably not going to collect all the points anyway. They can get points from international experience, but it is not obligatory. And finally, we are inviting all of them to participate in a workshop on intercultural learning. I am moving now towards the end and I have a feeling that I've been told that uh, I'm getting towards the end, but I can't see it. Again, looking at my uh, framework, how does this work? Well, on the one hand, first of all, we're trying to use the global graduate programs to establish contact points. Of course, an obvious example is the multicultural team where the students will meet and the students will interact. But in fact, the students who venture out into the local community, join a football club, join an international student organization, join other types of local activities, will also get contact points within the local community. Secondly, we encourage community service of various kinds. So we have students involving in youth organizations, for instance, the UN Youth Association, very popular with some of these students, but also organizations like ISEC. Finally, we try to facilitate this idea of connections. They're forming connections in the teams, they form connections through voluntary work, but they can do so also internationally through internships, through study abroad, but also by joining NGOs like ISEC, which offers the opportunity for these students to go abroad as an ISEC representative for Denmark. And we've seen several of these students do so. So just to get to the conclusion, well, first, as I, as I said, disruption certainly made me rethink what I make of international higher education. I don't think we'll be able to do what we've been achieved or continue doing the practices we had in Denmark for the past 20 years. I think there's an end to that with the government intervention with international student recruitment. So we need to some alternatives. And I think the literature does offer us something to where places to look if we want to facilitate some form of intercultural learning. I present the three core concepts, contact, community and connections, because I think there are ways for us to rethink alternative international stations, and it can certainly also be translated into cyberspace, which is the next thing I'm probably going to add to my reflections. And then, for, as I just talked about, I think there is practical inspiration to be had looking outside academia at some of the transnational social movements that are already in place, but also at some of the global citizenship schemes that have been adopted and an increasing number of universities around the world. Some of my examples for the global graduate are found in Canada, in the United States, in Germany, and I believe in Austria. And that takes me to the end with some pictures. And uh, these are pictures I'm allowed to reproduce. Global graduates, a recent uh, bunch from 2021, and then uh, from one of the national jamborees, some of the scouts out promoting the UN Agenda for Sustainable Change, the 17 SDGs. Some references and I'll stop sharing.
people can have the references if they email me. So no problem there. Thank you very much. That was a really interesting uh, talk, very timely. And uh, I'm sure um, we have lots of comments from, uh, from the audience. So I invite uh, everybody to ask question. Any questions for Hane Tange on her very interesting presentation? Well, we wait for um, questions. I've got a um, comment for you. I, I was particularly taken by uh, your idea of um, connections and connections to uh, physical places. Um, why is it that you decided to focus on this, uh, on this aspect for your theoretical framework? I think I'm a, I think I'm a globalization person really. And I think if you started your idea of glo the global international network with Hanads and Abu Durai, I think the idea of not having connections is simply, I, ca I can't imagine it. And I think I th I'm also, in the past looked at the work of Fasad Ritzvi and the cosmopolitan learner, which is sharing this idea that we have to relate. I'm using, I think physical sites are important. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, I've, been, I've been reading Castells recently and Castells certainly emphasizes the physical places in his, for his transnational movement. Because I think people find it, somehow they relate better to one another when they met. We know mm. that we're missing the coffee breaks at this conference. But I also think we need to start acknowledging the possibility of cyberspace. Mm -hmm. I certainly know that my global network, and I've got I've counted more than 40 countries in my global scouting network. And a lot of that is actually coming through cyberspace. So I think this this idea of reimagining, I certainly think we're going to go digital big time in the next two, three, four years with international higher education. Yeah. So would you kind of um, be exploring uh, cyber spaces where we can connect, how we define those spaces in, in, a, in a virtual environment? I will certainly uh, be immersed into it next term because a colleague and I have joined the Twente University in developing one of the micro modules. So for, as one of the, uh, well, just to fill you in, we have European alliances now being formed between universities and then my university, Old Boy, is part of what's called the ECIU alliance. And that alliance, building on the idea of problem-based learning, designs MEGA projects. Students can respond to societal challenges set to, to them by different communities around Europe, typically in the home environment of the universities. But to support the students, we're developing micro modules and we'll be developing or contributing to a micro module on intercultural competences where the students will be put together in teams working across these different, well, the national environments, but they're also institutional environments and they're probably also going to be working across disciplines as they mm -hmm. are, of course, from a variety of university topics. Yeah, well, we look forward to, um, to that part of your research. Let's see uh, any other questions, otherwise we'll have to move on to the next speaker. There's a question in the chat. Okay, let's see the chat. Thank you, Simon. I'm trying to see the chat now. Hi. Yeah. And Tatiana, Tatiana, I can unmute myself and ask her yes, directly. Hannah. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Anna. I was curious about the um, service learning component to say, how do you organize it as the uh, young people, the students or people or participants uh, um, encouraged to uh, arrange them themselves? Uh, what are they allowed to do or they encouraged to do? And what kind of criteria do you use for uh, service learning? Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. And I have to admit, the service learning is part of the literature review. I'm not teaching in programs where this is necessarily obvious. Uh, it's not part of, so I'm not, doing teacher, I'm not doing teacher training, that kind of thing, where we can include community service. What we do is internships. And I suppose what I do is I do, a, I do a lot of community learning when I'm involved with the scouts. So very much on the voluntary side as extracurricular activities. But because this is something that the students volunteer for, 
this is of course up to them how it's being designed. I think what we're doing is we're acknowledging their effort and we say, well, actually, if you engage with this, which is so important to your competence development, we will, if you do enough of it, award you with this special certificate that you can get in addition to your exam certificate and which you can enclose in a job application. And we actually have, as part of that certificate, defined, I believe, five areas of intercultural competence. So it becomes more obvious to the students what exactly they're learning by partaking in that kind of activities. I'd hope that answered the question. Great, thank you very much for your question, Tatiana, and your answer, Hane. Um, I, I cannot see any more questions now. So um, thank you very much, Hane, uh, for your contribution. And I hope to see you soon. Uh, let's move on to the next speaker, Simon Coffey, uh, from uh, the University uh, of London King's College. Um, he's going to be talking about the about, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to introduce him because he's a very old colleague of mine and, uh, and his uh, research interests. He's, uh, he's a very prolific writer. He's uh, written widely on intercultural communication. And in particular, he's interested in emotion, in language learning and the history of uh, language teaching. He's also um, written about autobiographical approaches to, uh, to language learning and also another area of expertise um, is teaching, uh, teaching education, um, teacher education. So finally, his, the title for his, uh, for his talk, you can see it now uh, on the screen, catching up with the zeitgeist, bringing diversity into intercultural learning. And I'm very much looking forward to listening to this uh, very interesting talk. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much, Christina. Thanks, and thanks to uh, the other two speakers uh, on this panel. I can see some commonalities in uh, some commonalities and some divergences in in what we're saying. Um, yeah, I, I'm quite aware that looking at the program for the conference, that uh, most of the talks are referring to English in one way or another, and um, in a way because. I'm based in, in England and I'm talking uh, really about modern foreign languages. So it's a little bit of a different uh, context in it. I mean, each context is different, but I'm aware that um, I'm talking not about English specifically. So I think it's relevant because the context of learning foreign languages in school settings in Anglophone countries is quite particular. <laughs> and uh, we do still learn uh, other languages. <laughs> Uh, believe it or not, but um, it, it throws up its own sort of challenges, that's for sure. Uh, just find out how to forward this. Um, yeah, so that is going to be, I think it's the same issue. To escape and forward and go like that. Must be a better way to, for, to page the PowerPoint, but never mind. Um, yeah, so the overview of the uh, presentation is this concept of confusion in a way, or apathy around uh, learning. I know that Anna mentioned it's often the, the fifth skill it's seen as a sort of add-on in a way. And um, <clears throat> despite bashing my head against the brick wall for many years, trying to encourage um, a more intercultural dimension to language teaching uh, in schools, I work in teacher education, as Christina said, it still seems to get sidelined. And uh, <clears throat> I'm quite concerned about that and often wonder why it's not uh, embedded really in to, um, into language lesson, lessons or even seen as an important part of the discourse around the rationale for language teaching. I don't want to go into too much specific detail about the little uh, nitty picky parts about the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, curriculum reform that's going on in England at the moment. But there are some proposals being pushed forward which are quite controversial and which reduce even more the role of languages in terms of it being a sort of code that's wrote there. Anyway, I've got a lot to go through. So my, um, what I really want to share with you today is not so much a study, uh, a particular study, it's more a reflection on my own practice 
in, in what I do at the university in teacher education program and how that's evolved in particular um, in light of um, the recent discourse uh, toward um, social justice and diversity, things like that, and how I think that that can help, it's helped me think, rethink a little bit differently how I present uh, intercultural work. Um, I also think there's a lack of really frank uh, sharing or discussion uh, or disclosure about our ethical, um, the ethical frameworks that we work within. And that's why I'm so pleased that the word ethics has come up a lot at this conference and it's quite important. Obviously, it's very easy to say we all want everyone to get on and be tolerant and accepting and stuff like that, but I'm not always sure um, concretely um, what that's being, what sort of framework that's being nailed to. Um, so, yeah, just to give a little bit of context then um, from the UK side, um, from the English side, I should say, because Scotland is a different thing, but the National Curriculum for Languages in England, or the, the current National Curriculum states boldly that learning a foreign language is a liberation from insularity and provides an opening to other cultures. Obviously, that's a little bit ironic from the gov same government that gave us Brexit, but that being aside, um, it's not a new claim in a way that this is a sort of liberation from insularity. We saw it in an earlier document from uh, 1977 that la learning foreign languages would help to create in pupils a less insular and prejudiced outlook. So it sounds nice, um, but in a way, what does that mean? What does it look like more concretely in a sense? Um, it's also worth noting in the latest version of the national curriculum that the word culture is there somewhere. The word intercultural, which had been in the previous version has moved. I see that as part of a, it's a discursive move, but I see it as part of a broader trend away from intercultural as process and to re reformulating as had been in the past, uh, culture as a, as a sort of knowledge, as a form of knowledge. Um, yeah, so that just states that uh, difference there between 2008 and the most recent 2014 version. So, uh, yeah, as I say, the intercultural aspect is largely absent from MFL stands for modern foreign languages. It's largely absent from uh, modern foreign language lessons uh, in contexts that I'm familiar with in, in England. Um, this speaks to me of a much wider and deeper disciplinary identity crisis almost um, in language teaching, either as a sort of a humanities subject within the liberal arts tradition or as a more practical, instrumentally oriented um, communication uh, type activity. I think they, it means different things to different people and there's some discomfort around what role culture has, or intercultural training has within that quite mixed model. So I think there needs to be a much greater clarity uh, in our rationale for language teaching. Uh, as I say, I think it's particular in a, in a sense to, um, I mean, I can't say that because I don't teach in English in your context, but I think that most people, as we've heard, subscribe to the fact that English is pretty useful to, to know anyway. So I think we have both a limit, but also possibly an opportunity when we talk about languages other than English. Um, yeah, so why is there this ambivalence to the intercultural dimension? This is my, my fundamental question. It sounds like common sense to say that language learning broadens your horizons, makes you more broad-minded, more tolerant, I don't know what the evidence is for that, to be honest. I don't really see any evidence for it. I see that language learning is the activity of language learning as a sort of project. Sustained language learning beyond compulsory level uh, is characterized by um, social class distinctions, most certainly. Also, gender distinctions to a certain degree um, towards very localized family, um, heritage background, things like that. There's a lot going on in a way in, in the view of social, uh, in the view of language learning as a social practice. 
it, that doesn't sit very well with the national model of language learning, which obviously suggests a sort of uniform system. Certainly, I, I do have faith that education uh, has an important role to play in the socialization of children and uh, can influence their view of the world. I mean, I hope so. I cite here some uh, work from a colleague of mine who noticed, for example, in, in the light of Brexit, uh, how citizenship books in Germany referenced the Euro European Union and Europeanness, European identity, much more than citizenship books in, in the UK. So in a way, you can see that any sort of critical uh, pedagogy would tell you quite quickly that um, Europe or, or interna international identity, if you like, is much less referenced in teaching in the UK. But of course, that can't be seen in isolation. The school system can't be seen in isolation from the broader society as part of the issue. My view is that talking about culture, I call it an ideological minefield. One of the reasons I think is that it's become such a sensitive issue that in a way teachers uh, shy away from it. Um, <clears throat> on the one hand, we don't want to talk about sort of quite static, essentialized notions of what culture um, is. They do this over there. But on the and so we become a little bit nervous around how we frame culture. I just put this just for a bit of fun because I do quite a lot of historical work. Um, this extract from a Victorian geography book, which has for each country, it has the topography, the industry, things like that, and also has a section on character. So for France, it says the French are remarkable for their vivacity, impetuosity, and fickleness, etc. So it has these very essentialized <clears throat> characteristics. Um, imparted on each, for each um, per people, for each uh, country, which is quite amusing, but at the same time, um, I, I wonder how we can talk about things like that now. Is there such a thing as a national characteristic, national character traits, or uh, do we have to um, strip any discussion of uh, other cultural um, habits or, or characteristics um, from that. It's a sort of um, problem for me because at one, on one hand, I'm drawn to uh, this quite romantic image of uh, what it, you know, how I imagine Spain to be or something like that. But uh, uh, my rational head tells me that, you know, people are people and you can't reduce people to these sort of national stereotypes. I think it's uh, something that we, it uh, doesn't sit well with us. Uh, in a sense. Often, if you talk to people uh, about their history of language learning, they often have quite romantic pictures of um, what drew them to different cultures, might be the literature, might be the, <clears throat> the, the nightlife, something like that. But of course, we don't really talk about that so much in uh, intercultural exchange, which is much more serious and much more, you know, we want people to be tolerant and so Anyway, so my critique that I usually give is that communicative language teaching squeezes out um, much interesting talk about other cultures and uh, interculturality because it reduces language teach language to a sort of code of communication. Despite what I do on my teacher training courses, I know that when people go into schools, they're often caught in this quite sort of behaviorist loop in a way, in this behavior as pedagogy. My colleague calls it, as the Wingo calls, lots of games and little challenge, where they do lots of games and activities and stuff like that, but don't really do any, uh, it could be the same if it were a German lesson or a Spanish lesson or a French lesson in a way. The code changes, but the activities are more or less the same. Um, and there isn't really much talk about culture, there isn't much space for culture in a strong communicative syllabus. It gets added on a little bit with little bits of fun, sort of um, bits and pieces like eating snails or putting fish on the back or stuff like that. More sort of serious critical um, analysis shows that um, if you know the work of John Gray, for example, he's shown that in his work on the Global Coursebook, that there's a sort of 
political and ideological reason for removing um, sensitive material or potentially upsetting material. <clears throat> he calls it the parsnip um, test, if you like. So removing politics, it's, a, it's an acronym for politics, alcohol, religion, sex, narcotics. One those out of any uh, global course books because they may offend or they may cause some controversy. So it becomes sort of distilled down to quite a bland um, learning of code. I know my colleagues, for example, Ben Rampton and Carol Ambers, Carol Ambers um, showed that in sensitive areas such as post-conflict areas of language uh, teaching, um, people deliberately avoid talking about any cultural contrast or any cultural um, content, and they stick in a way to the safety of of language as code, language being a, you know, grammar, vocabulary learning and stuff. And okay, we're not in post-conflict area in London, but I still get a sense that it's, there are a lot of mixed sensitivities going on in the classroom. So I think it, it, it's safer to stick to, you know, the language um, as a sort of, yeah, the language code type metaphor. Of course, I encourage a whole range of different activities. Um, sometimes they're done in small ways and I think they're great, but they're not really integral to the main business of language teaching. And they're certainly never assessed. We have no sort of project-based assessments or anything like that. It's just, you know, if you've remembered the vocabulary, if you've got the right grammar, it's very dry, <clears throat> the form of testing. Certainly, up to the age of 16, gets a little bit more content oriented afterwards. So, yeah, so there's just some little sort of typical things that you might do. Uh, I might encourage the use of stories and literature in very modest ways. This is a little project I worked on with a master's student, for example, who did um, a really interesting project with the UPT Plus, not just on a, on a sort of word level, but acting out, doing drama, things like that. So there's lots of interesting stuff that can be done. Of course, there's always the problem of the word culture and what that means. In that geography book, Victorian geography book I referred to a moment ago, the word culture doesn't figure in that book because it hadn't yet, except to talk about agriculture culture, because it hadn't yet taken on the metaphorical meaning that we understand it uh, to have. Although I think there's still uh, you know, it's a big uh, question, of course, what, what culture is. Uh, our colleague, uh, Christine, and, and my colleague, uh, Brian Street, uh, wrote an article called Culture is a Verb, because he was an anthropologist and had this sort of, uh, you know, gets in view of <coughs> culture as something always um, that you have to look up close to see, and then it always moves around. It's not something you can pin down. But um, how that translates into uh, language teaching, of course, uh, is something I'll talk about now. One of the things you can start to do, I mentioned John Gray already in his analysis of textbooks, but I think uh, it's great fun doing some sort of like critical pedagogy with, uh, with teachers looking at textbooks. This is one, uh, a French book that I used myself when I was at school. And it's one I like to do because I do quite a lot of uh, analysis of old textbooks and of course that wouldn't tick a lot of uh, culture and diversity uh, boxes these days because it's a very you know typical white middle class um, French family that was the sort of image of France that I had when I was at school thinking everyone lived in a nice detached house they always went on picnics and stuff like that so that's one image of France but I liked it I like that image even though I it wasn't the reality I, I, I knew personally. Um, yeah, so some of the th obvious things that I try and encourage is when, on a very basic level, when people are teaching colours, to try to get some sort of cultural representation in there at least, um, to tick, a, not just sounds a bit reductive to say to tick boxes, but to take into account at least uh, the fact that we're not just talking about France, when we're talking about French. And colours can be introduced uh, by flags, for example, things like that, in much more interesting ways than just um, learning colours for the sake of it. The Simpsons is always used in modern language lessons a lot. I don't know why, but they're really seen as a fun, sort of uh, easy um, model of 
a person. And uh, I think it drives me nuts, but I try and encourage a more diverse uh, representation, at least of um, different French um, personalities, different French celebrities. Yeah, I, I think based on my own PhD and um, work I've done over the last few years, and I know Christina has as well, um, I really think that we need to look at the differentiation in a way of experience of what different language, not what different languages mean, but what language learning itself means to different people. So we have this national model which tries to homogenize in the way we experience uh, national assessment benchmarks and things like that. Within that, I think we really need to try as best we can <coughs> to uh, understand in a way the local contingencies that are going on within the classrooms that we're in. Many of the class, classrooms of the schools I work with in East London, for example, have a completely different conception of what French or Spanish or German means than if you were in a, in a, in a middle class, you know, girls independent school out in the counties, for example. So uh, some form of um, differentiation, I think, uh, needs to be built in uh, to uh, intercultural work to link in a way what the input is and <coughs> um, how it corresponds to localised realities. Uh, yeah, there's been quite a big turn recently in emotions, which is another area that I'm working a lot in at the moment. <coughs> it's something I'll talk about uh, in a second, it's funny, I did my whole PhD on, um, on biographies and didn't really use emotions then because it was a long time ago and we were talking always about identity and motivation and things like that. Now emotions, explicit talk about emotions has come to the fore. I think it's, it's really great because I think really what we're trying to do, what I see intercultural work is doing is trying to develop empathy and that can be uh, translated across different contexts, different material, but I think that's the goal. For me, it is anyway. But it's something that I want to really share and ideas more about really what our motivation is. Yeah, another way to say that is the way I quote Christina there, not just because I knew she'd be here, but because her, her work's so great, is about humanizing the language learner. We, get children to remember this vocabulary and understand grammar and stuff like that, we don't always take into account the imaginal, in a sense, what's, what's happening for them in their mental lives. So how do we do that? One way of doing that is by listening to them. I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of linguistic repertoire. One of the ways that we can do that is to get them to draw out their linguistic repertoires. I did it on body shapes and other people have done that as well, but there are different ways of representing them. It doesn't just have to be about, um, uh, you know, levels of competence based on sort of grammatical accuracy and stuff. Yeah, I always like to uh, share my memories of this first school trip I had to Belgium when I was about 12, when we were given the test to do about, you know, the, um, <coughs> Epitomium and things like that. But my memory of it, of course, because I was 11 or 12 years old, were with different suites, but nobody asked about that. So, in a way, it's just that's a little sort of uh, tiny example, but it's a way of really, because we're working with young children, it's a way of really understanding what's going on for them. How do they interpret the difference uh, that they're confronted with? As I mentioned before, a lot of um, the work in the autobiographies that I worked with on my PhD intersected with uh, social class, with aspirations for social class, so that the language learning project almost became a form of uh, aspiration uh, to reinvent oneself, to, um, to move across class boundaries. That's an extract from somebody who the first impression of France was staying with a more middle class family and seeing these uh, wonderful things around. So, yeah, my argument is that a single model of culture doesn't work for all, even though the strap line is um, from the um, advocacy campaign is always language is for all. It sounds very democratizing, but I don't, I don't think it works. Uh, languages for all, yeah, but a single model of provision for all, I don't think works. I do think uh, modern languages needs to be rethought in 
case such as mine, which is teaching foreign languages in an English setting, needs to be really not just seen. The traditional model can't, isn't sustainable in a way. <laughs> People know that they can get by without speaking foreign languages now in sort of tourist bubble. It needs to be embedded in a much broader connected um, landscape in a way of whole language and literacy development. Um, it needs to be accompanied by some identity work. I'll reference later, I'll reference in a moment, I'm running out of time. Um, I've already heard from other people the importance of history in person is the autobiography thing, but also uh, relationship to place and relationship to objects. I'll just plug there Christina's new book that's coming out, which um, uh, talks about that, our relationship to objects. Yeah, as I mentioned briefly then, so I think it would be more helpful to start talking more about uh, developing empathy rather than this international outlook. International outlook doesn't sit well with me personally, because what does it mean? Um, it means that uh, you could be part of a sort of nice transnational mobile <laughs> elite or something like that. But lots of the children I work with in, in London schools don't like their language lessons. They're not little white uh, parochial uh, children in country villages or something. There's, they are very plugged into international networks already. It doesn't mean that the offer of what's going on in schools speaks to them. So there needs to be, I think, much, uh, not just talk about international unless it's qualified in some way. Of course, the intercultural is always interpersonal. I think the turn to emotions I've mentioned already, I think is very important. Um, yeah, just a couple of things about how we could get there, implications for pedagogy. I think there needs to be a much more explicit uh, discussion about um, our ethical starting point in teacher education and in schools in general. More exper um, experiential meta discussion. Yeah, I mentioned their Forbes um, at Al because um, they do lots of work on this sort of running alongside uh, language teaching. They do this sort of meta strand of reflecting. Um, on uh, what's going on for you in terms of emotion and stuff. I cite some other people there. I'm doing this thing on sound at the moment. So there's lots of work going on in that area. Um, yeah, so just coming to the end now, it's my last slide, is the really this absence of ethical mooring, I think, is a big problem for me. Maybe I'm just missing it or I don't read enough uh, books about it, but I don't really um, get what people mean always when they talk about uh, where they're coming from in terms of um, developing um, intercultural um, awareness. Are we talking, uh, where do we come from? Uh, what, uh, what's our faith perspective, if we have one, for example? I think it, is, it could be more explicit. We know that education has always been linked to faith until at least the 18th century. Um, and that was very clear then what the model was of why children are learning this. You know, we have a very strict hierarchy in society. It makes sense that children, certain children learn this for this, certain children learn this for that. What's replaced it in a way? What does post-Cartesian pedagogy look like uh, in language teaching? I personally am drawn to Foucault's technologies of the self as a model, but I haven't it's not really the purpose of my paper, but I just think it's important to show a theoretical framing, at least when we're talking about things like this. So as I say, I think for me, it's about uh, the emotions paradigm now offers really exciting uh, shift towards that in terms of uh, talking about developing empathy rather than this sort of difficult to pin down uh, sort of mindset thing. Uh, yeah, so there's a, a book I reference in the references Smith and Carville who talk about uh, the language learning from a Christian perspective. It's not my personal um, thing, but I think it's a really well written account of how it fits into uh, a faith perspective in terms of um, developing qualities of guest and uh, hospitality and things like that. I think it's interesting in the sense that I don't really hear that much uh, discussion around that. A lot of things are taken for granted. But, um, I think in, in discussions are not always, always made explicit. Um, so anyway, there's some references and I think that's it. And thank you for listening. So it's all work in progress. I think so.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. That was a, a tour de force, tour de force of uh, language learning and emotions and lots of other topics. Very interesting. I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, questions for you and reactions and comments to um, what you've been talking about. Anybody wants to go first and ask Simon a question or make a comment? Tatiana, over to you. Uh, Sam, thank you very much. Uh, um, I really like your ideas about indeed, uh, using a more critical pedagogy also to teach the language, uh, uh, languages at all levels. I think that in one of the slides you had indeed the difference between or of the kind of disconnect between uh, what the students expect from language education uh, or this idea of France and traveling and what they get grammar. But I think that you, what you might want to add here is the moment that you engage with them uh, through a critical pedagogy, it might be very uneasy for them. So it might it be might what? Also, sorry, I missed the word. I missed not, the word it then. might be difficult for them as well. So they might not expect also to have to do, you know, identity work and be confronted. So it might also be something that they kind of react uh, a, a bit. Uh, harsh at the beginning because uh, uh, being confronted with injustice, being confronted with things that are going on uh, in the country that they think of, uh, oh, I would love to go there, maybe live there, might also be difficult. So critical pedagogy might add another layer of... Uh, I agree. Uh, I really think this, that's uh, a really good... I think that's such a good point, Tatiana. It's a really good point. I mean, lots of the work that's done, especially in post-16, um, for older children um, who do languages is very um, and within the sort of social justice and diversity mm -hmm. agenda is very citizenship oriented and we'll talk about social problems in France and Spain or whatever and it just becomes a little bit um, yeah off-putting it becomes a bit yeah. miserable this to be honest we don't want to go back I mean there's a fear of going back to this glorifying the other and talking about wonderful body of literature and cultural canon and stuff, it seems very elitist. And yet I think that that is what drew me anyway. So I, I think we have to be careful as not to make everything doom and gloom in a way. I think that's right. No, so I think in the idea that the, uh, th still through the uh, critical pedagogy, the idea of hope, uh, giving students uh, activities mm -hmm. of ideas where they can also become kind of pragmatic and developing ideas for engaging with something. Uh, at yeah. whatever levels, as in the small community or outside, we have seen a lot of interesting examples of that. So that could be an idea. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm. I would like to congratulate all the speakers because. You raised uh, something I, I liked was all the questions you were raising from uh, practice, from your practice and all the doubts. And I, I was thinking um, <clears throat> how relevant it is, all the, the issues you raised, the three of you, for teacher development being a language teacher um, is even more difficult nowadays with uh, uh, so many demands uh, we, um, to do this and to do that and to do that and then try to respond to the actual students um, that uh, teachers have in the classroom in different contexts. So just uh, being aware that is not a matter of doing everything or responding to you know all the all the necessary uh, demands, but actually establishing priorities according to the context, uh, the the teachers and the so this is this is not exactly a question but a, a reflection on uh, what um linked your um 
talks. Very, very interesting, very, thank you very much uh, to you, Simon and Hannah and uh, Anna. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think the sensitivity to context is, is really important for me. I just wanted to add that um, this talk of diversity is something which really fires up my young trainee teachers now. And I think a lot of the substance doesn't seem that different from what I've always said under the intercultural umbrella. But the word diversity is sort of um, fires them up in a, in a new way. So I don't know how much is I don't want to say rebranding, it's a reorientation in a way of what we've always been saying, I think, a lot of it, but yeah. Uh, and a similar kind of, um, on, on a similar kind of line, one of the things that struck me from, uh, from everybody's talk is, is how language and intercultural communication is, should be looked at from uh, the perspective of how it impacts on every single person. So what language learning means, as uh, Simon said as well, to different people. Um, so it's not only the kind of contextualization of the, the, the place, but also the contextualization of, of the person. And uh, on that note, I really liked um, your, um, uh, Simon, your image, your uh, slide on the sweets that you ate when you went on an exchange to France. I think you should write an article on that, on memories about my French sweets. That's my suggestion for your next research. Any, uh, any other comments? I think there were lots of very interesting um, topics and, and, and lines of um, research and reflections, as Manuela is saying. And, and I particularly like your, your emphasis that has been um, also mentioned in other talks about developing empathy in intercultural communication. I think that's a, a key key idea as well. <clears throat> can I yeah. can I add anything uh, uh, more? Oh. Uh, yeah, there was so much end. indeed that you said so many lines of interesting uh, things to say. We need uh, about the empathy, I think is important what you said, Simon, the fact that starting from uh, yourself and then connecting uh, to others and connecting to uh, uh, to the um, context, uh, as also uh, Manuela said, is, is very important. And I think here indeed that um, a very interesting notion that you might know already is the notion of that uh, Miriam Sobre uses, and it's a notion of a peoplehood instead of personhood. And peoplehood is indeed acknowledging the diversity, but really in a way that uh, creates bridges and this idea of bridging. Is very important in her idea of in the cosmopolitan um, cosmopolitan pedagogy, critical cosmopolitan pedagogy. So maybe indeed this idea of peoplehood could help you develop uh, uh, the program through uh, because I think it's really a very 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 interesting way how she presents these connections to other through humility first, uh, being humble about who you are, where you are from, uh, being a reflective of yourself, but also reaching out uh, to change things. Uh, Thank you, Tatiana. Yeah, that's a really good, a good lead. Yeah, thank you. Christina, I think you're speaking, aren't you? But you're on mute. Did you say something? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just saying that I think now we will have to draw this to a close and uh, finish this very interesting discussion by Anna Maria and uh, Hanne and Simon. And um, I wish you all the best for the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.